clap your hands one more time. Glorify God and thank Him for His goodness toward you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I was in a business meeting the other day and we were talking about uh, providing, working toward providing homes for uh, people affordable and attainable housing, workforce housing, all types of housing in communities and things like that. We start talking about what I just mentioned, our pathway to create jobs and so forth and so on like that. And they were talking about all the various programs that we're trying to do here and have been doing for years, our Texas Offenders Reentry Initiative and all of those types of programs. And I said to them in the meeting, that's what Jesus looks like. While the rest of the world is arguing over whether he's tall or short or black or white or male or female, that's what Jesus looks like. Jesus looks like the Word made flesh, the Word in action. Not just studying His Word, but doing His Word. Not just hearing His Word, but doing His Word. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld the wonder of His glory. How many of you want to see the Word made flesh? That's what we come for here tonight. I'm gonna to be teaching tonight on glimpses of Jesus. Glimpses of Jesus. Yes. We have not seen him in his fullness. We are unlike the disciples and the generation where he walked the earth. We have not seen him in his fullness. We are more blessed than that. They, they, they envy us. Jesus told Thomas, you have believed because you have seen. But blessed are they who have not seen and yet they believe. Yeah, bless. so the real blessing goes not to the person who sees, but the person who does not see but yet believes. The Apostle Paul said that now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face. In the interim, we catch glimpses of Jesus like you catch glimpses when you wear dark sunglasses and you catch a glimpse of something, but if, when you really want to see it real clear, you have to take those sunglasses off. I see some of y'all try to be cool in the building, you know, you got the sunglasses on, but the lights are low and you can't see, but you look good. Maybe y'all never did that. I've done that a time or two. Sometimes you got to sacrifice for the sake of fashion, praise the Lord. And, and you're looking real good, but you cannot see. When we look into the Word of God, we look into the Word of God through the veil of our humanity and our flesh and our carn carnality. We bring into it our perspectives, our backgrounds, our experiences, and all of that shades our view of Jesus. Because Jesus is bigger than you. He's bigger than your background. He's bigger than your experiences. He's bigger than what you've been through. He's bigger than your gender. He's bigger than your ethnicity. He's bigger than the region you come from, the country you come from, the language you speak, the political philosophies you have. He's bigger than all of that. And yet, that has a tendency to taint the way in which we see the scriptures. It affects the way we see everything in life. We see through a glass darkly yet we believe yet we believe the crazy thing is to have faith in the dark hallelujah to walk not by sight but by faith and to dare to believe God in spite of the fact that he has not yet done everything that you expected him to do and he may not do everything that you expect him to do because you're not in charge of him. Right. Right. And he's not waiting on you to give him orders for you to get on your knees and give him his assignment like he's a school child. He's still boss. You can make a request, but you can't give orders because you're not God. Only God can give orders. You gotta have power to give orders. 
you got to have authority to give orders. And some people think that prayer is us giving orders. No, it's making your requests made known unto God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep our hearts and minds. But you don't order God around. You can't hardly order your children around anymore. So you know good and well you can't order God around. And I'm glad I can't order him, Pastor, because sometimes I would have ordered things to my own destruction. As I look back on my life, some of the things I asked for would have got me in trouble. And so I shout because he said no. Sister Gwen, I'm happy because he said no. I'm happy for the jobs I didn't get. I'm happy for the girls that wouldn't date me. Oh, y'all aren't going to say nothing to me. I'm happy for the house that didn't close. I'm happy for the trip I didn't get to take because he, do, he is good, 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 and he doeth all things well. There has to be a humility that comes into our faith that makes us understand that we're glimpsing him. That's why we got to be careful how we treat people because we only have glimpses of Jesus. You don't know as much as you think you know. You're not as smart as you think you are. You're seeing through a glass darkly. His face is veiled. We don't see the fullness of him as we will when he comes back again. Somebody say amen. amen. And I'm going to read a few passages of scripture in your hearing uh, to set up the context and the atmosphere from which we will extrapolate certain ideas for your consideration tonight to the intent that your soul might be edified by the visitation of the Holy Spirit as he reveals to us glimpses of who Jesus is. We are much like uh, Rebecca who came back to meet Isaac and the servant was describing the groom that she had never met. God gives you the Holy Spirit like that servant so that while we are on the journey toward heaven, he would describe to us, come on somebody, I know I got a few Bible scholars in here, that he would describe to us a Jesus we've never seen. She had never seen Isaac, but he had been described by the servant. And the Holy Spirit does not speak of himself, but he shall testify and repeat that which he has heard. And he's telling us about Jesus. Jesus. Have you ever had the Spirit within you tell you something about Jesus that you didn't know? Reveal something. And really what happens in the service when, when your spirit ignites it and people, we call it getting happy, people get happy or they get excited or they get goose pimples or chill bumps or shout hallelujah. Often it is resp in response to the fact that what has been said opens up a window. Behold! Then you catch a glimpse. Behold, the Bible says. Behold, behold. You just caught a glimpse of Jesus. Behold, he cometh in clouds. Behold, we shall not all sleep. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Behold, this same Jesus that you see us sin shall descend in like manner. Behold is an announcement that you're about to catch a glimpse. Glory to God. And, my, and, and, and this might put us out of business, but you don't have to be in church to have a behold moment. You can be washing your dishes and have a behold moment. You can be driving down 35 and have a behold moment. You can be sitting up in your prayer room and have a behold moment. And next thing you know, you got tears running down your face. And all of a sudden, you're murmuring and the people in the other car think you're crazy because nobody's in the car but you, but you're talking to somebody because behold. <laughs> Oh, my God. Let's get into this. This is going to be good. It says to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 7, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man, man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost. 
in whom the God of this world, little g, little g, pay attention to that, in whom the God of this world, whenever you see the term God of this world and it's a little g, it's talking about the enemy, Satan. He is the God of this world. That's why we have so, so much craziness going on because he is the God of this world. Small g, he is the God of this world. Have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light. He has blinded the minds of them which believe not. He has blinded, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to get that a minute. He has blinded the eyes of them that believe not. They're not disbelieving because they're bad or because they're wicked or because they don't want to see. Many times the enemy has blinded the eyes of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention to the language here. Go back to that verse. Lest the light of the, of the glorious gospel of Christ, he, he is not using these metaphors by accident. He is setting the stage to make a comparison through shadows and typologies between that which we know about in the Old Testament and is yet to be revealed in the New. You must understand that at the time that the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, this is not a Bible. This is only a letter to the church at Corinth. It has not yet been canonized. So when he refers to this light, he has blinded the minds of them which believe not. He's talking about darkness. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. He's giving us language. Watch that language. He's giving us language. Come on, give me verse 5. Come on. For we preach not ourselves. Wait, we were just talking about the light. And now he's talking about preaching. What does light have to do with preaching? I tell you, I'll make it easy for you. The Bible said the entrance of thy word giveth light. The entrance of thy word giveth light. God doesn't have to give us darkness. Darkness is not a thing that has to be given. It already exists. The entrance of thy word giveth light. Glory to God. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, now this is when he really spills the beans. For God who commanded, who commanded the light. Hold up right there. God can command the light. If you were to command the light, if you had the power, if you had the authority to command the light, in what language would you command it? What language does light speak? Does light speak Spanish or French? Uh, do, does light speak Mandarin or English? Only God knows the language of light. God can speak in the language. We, we haven't even got to the authority whereby he is able to have authority over light. It's one thing to have authority, but to communicate that authority means that you have to be able to speak in the language of light. Oh, God, help us to speak in the language of light. We already have people who speak in the language of darkness. Let me be a person who speaks in the language of light, that when I open my mouth and part my lips, that light comes out of my mouth. Woo, glory to God. This is good and I'm just getting started. I haven't, I haven't even gotten to it and I'm already happy. Glory to God. Have you ever had people who speak light? They come into the room and all of a sudden you get illuminated. You were in a bad mood and in five minutes all of a sudden you feel the darkness part because out of their mouth comes light. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give, to give, to give. You don't even have to pay for it. To give the light of the knowledge 
Knowledge is light. Oh, gosh. It's going to take me all night to read this scripture. It's going to take me all night to read this scripture. To give the light of the knowledge, the entrance of God's word giveth light. Paul prayed in Ephesians that the eyes of our understanding might be enlightened. Now, if our understanding can be enlightened, that means our understanding can be dark. Come on, somebody. And what we need is for God to enlighten our understanding because a dark understanding will bring death. It brings death to a marriage. It brings death to a ministry. It brings death to relationships. It brings death to situations because a lot of times we are speaking what we understand, but our understanding has not been enlightened. What you thought was smart is now starting to become foolishness. How many of you can look back at something that you used to think was smart and now you think it's foolish? Something that used to make you laugh and now you think it's ridiculous. Somebody you wanted to be around and now you don't want to be around around them. They haven't changed. You have, you have changed. God has caused the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to shine into your heart. Good God of mercy. He is making this comparison between the God who stepped out on nothing the God who stepped out into nothing, not even atmosphere, and said, let there be something, and it became whatever he said because he was God. Why would we be shocked that Jesus could walk on water when God could stand on air? stood on absolutely nothing and said, let there be, and it became whatever he said because he's God. He didn't need a ladder. He didn't need an elevator. He didn't need a platform. He didn't need a two by four to stand on. He just stood all by himself on nothing. God and God alone stood out before there was atmosphere, before there was stratosphere, before there was a law of gravity, before there was a where or when or this or that God alone beside him there is no other God alone stood out on nothing and started speaking something into existence because the creative power and influence of his word caused all matter to materialize so that we know, according to the Gospel of St. John, that things that do appear, you know, Hebrews 11, were not made from things that do appear. In other words, there was nothing there, and everything that appeared was made out of his word. With the things that do appear were not made from things that do appear. That's your God. That's your God I'm talking about. That's your God. If he could speak things into existence and cause them to be, he could speak kidneys. He could speak liver. He could speak lungs. He could speak wholeness of blood. God doesn't need stuff to make stuff. All God needs is God. God stepped out on nothing and said, let there be something. And it became what he said because it's God. Oh, do you hear what I'm saying to you? Open your mouth and say, speak something. When God speaks, matter moves. Molecules leap. Atoms connect. When God speaks, things start coming together bone to his bone. When God speaks, things start to materialize. When God speaks, he doesn't need a hammer or a nail or concrete or anything. When God speaks, it just appears because he's God. That's why I told you Peter could walk on the water because Jesus said, come. And God's word is what causes matter to materialize. And the book says he was walking on water, but I say he was walking on the word. He was walking on one word was enough for him to defy the laws of nature. When God speaks, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, 
It's the same God who commanded the frogs to attack Pharaoh, commanded the lice to attack Pharaoh, commanded boils to break out on their body. How would you command a boil? Who speaks boil but God? Who speaks frog but God? Who speaks lice but God? God can speak to anything and make it move. He said, you're not fighting the king. The heart of the king is in my hand. I can turn it any way I want to turn it because I'm God. I can make your enemies be at peace with you because I'm God. I can do whatever I want to do. I'm God. I don't have to meet with nobody. Nobody has to elect me. Nobody has to appoint me. Nobody can dethrone me. Nobody can impeach me. I'm God. I just want to be clear who we're talking about. Somebody shout God. Then it goes on and digresses and says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. What a strange commodity that something so powerful would house, would shack up, would live, would domesticate with something so fragile. We have this treasure <laughs> in earthen vessels. The creator of matter allows himself to live in matter. I won't even bother the fact that the treasure is holy and the vessel is human. I won't even bother the fact that the, the treasure is clean and the vessel is filthy. I won't even bother the fact that the treasure is celestial and the vessel is terrestrial. I won't even bother the fact that the treasure is eternal and the vessel is true. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Earthen vessels in dirt. We have it in dirt. God in dirt. God in clay. God in humanity. And we have it. We have it. He's given it to us. We have it. It's not just that he has us. We have him. We have him. Like I have shoes, I have a car, I have a coat, I have shoes, I have a watch, I have a ring, I have God. That statement alone is mind-boggling. That God would allow himself to be possessed by something he made is mind-boggling. That we have God, we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have it, the contrast makes it clear. The contrast between the treasure and the vessel makes it clear that the excellency of the power is not coming from the vessel, it's coming from the ointment on the inside. If there is anything good in me, I don't have to wonder whether it's me or him or not. If there's anything good in me, it's got to be God because I know that the vessel is earthen, but the treasure is divine. Oh my God. That's where I wanted to start. I wanted to start there because what Paul does in glimpses of Jesus is remind us of the creation that God stepped out on nothing and said, let there be light. And there was light and it was good. The light, the light, 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 light came from his word. Word, 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 word. It didn't come from waterfalls. It didn't come from coals. It didn't come from solar systems. The light, let there be light, came out of his word, 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 word. And it is the word that said, let there be light, has not come back to him. It is still out there. 
Because the book of Hebrews chapter 1 says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Who? That ought to make you happy because he spoke you. He spoke you. And until he decides to move, I will remain as long as the word holds me up. He upholds all things by the word of his power. How long will my blessing last as long as my word is behind it? <laughs> How long will I be able to endure as long as my word holds you up? How long will I be able to walk on water as long as my word holds you up? He upholds what? All things by the word of his power. Somebody talk to me. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. He is reminding us in 2 Corinthians that who God is, he was. Who God is, he was. Who God is, he was. He changeth not. He is absolute. He cannot grow. <laughs> he cannot evolve. He cannot decline. He cannot subtract. He just is. Who shall I say sent me? I am that I am. <laughs> I'm not becoming, I just am. <laughs> he that cometh to God must first believe that he, what? Is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You have to understand that God is. He neither declines or increases. He just is. And that's where you begin to understand that God isn't making this up as he goes along. Thy word, O oh Lord, is forever settled in the heavens. It's done. The plan is done. Oh, let me bring it closer. The lamb was slain from the foundations of the world. Jesus was slain before the cross was made. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you about eternity and you're thinking about time. Eternity transcends time, you know. Time is just a ball, a ball of yarn in the room of eternity. Time is so small that I remember when it was born. The book of Genesis says the evening and the morning was the first day. Not of God. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You, you don't think that they're talking about it was the first day of God. It was the first day of time. For God does not exist in time, therefore he cannot get old. God exists in eternity. We exist in time. That's why you have birthdays. God can't have a birthday because he always is. He is before Mary was. You understand what I'm saying? Are you following what I'm saying? So, so what Paul is doing here is taking us back and showing us glimpses of Jesus in Genesis. For God who commanded the light to shine in darkness, that's Jesus. Oh, y'all don't believe me. When God said, let there be light, that was Jesus. When God said, let there be light, that was Jesus. I can prove it to you. John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was what? The light of, 
the light of men. So when God said, let there be light, he's saying, let there be Jesus, because Jesus is the light, the light of the world. Jesus is the light, the light of the world. So whatever Jesus is, he was. If he's light now, he was light then. If I had time tonight, I would show you that light existed in the creation three days before the sun was ever made. He created the sun on the fourth day. He said, let there be light on the first day. So we have three days of unexplainable light. We have light before we have sun because the light is... Oh, come on here, somebody. Talk to me tonight. I feel like discussing his word with you. Let there be light in the hospital. Let there be light in South Africa. Let there be light in Afghanistan. Let there be light in Iraq. Let there be light in Brazil. Let there be light in Haiti. Let there be light in Washington. Let there be light in South Dallas. Let there be light in Harlem. Let there be light in the Bronx. Let there be light, 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 light. Glimpses of Jesus. He which is and was and is to come. That's what Revelations call him, he which is and was and is to come. I am the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Do you hear what I, uh, how every good and perfect gift cometh down from above in whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. God said, I don't even have the shadow of a turn. I am solid as a rock. I am stable. I am everlasting. I am immutable. I am eternal. I am sovereign. I am God. I was God before you were there to tell me I was God. I was there before the stars of the morning sang their first song. I was there before the angels clapped their wings into the air. I was God before there was a where or when or this or that. I alone I alone I looked for something greater to swear by than myself and I couldn't find anything greater than myself. Therefore I swear by myself that my word is true. I am God. I'm not your church, I'm not your building, I'm not your bishop, I'm not your denomination, I'm not your organization, I'm not your doctrine, I'm not your creed, I'm not your board of directors, I'm not your trustees, I'm God! And so, I'm going to talk a little bit out of Genesis 2. Y'all doing all right? I want to talk a little bit out of Genesis 2, chapter 7 through 9, uh, be, because it, it continues to validate this strange intercourse between divinity and humanity. This strange habitation, this, this odd couple between the celestial and the terrestrial, between the human and the divine. In, in Genesis 2, 7 through 9, it's where we first are introduced to our God and we find him playing in the dirt. As soon as he separated the firmaments that were above the waters from the firmaments that were beneath the waters, as soon as he told the sea how far to come in and commanded it to retract back and held it back by boundaries, as soon as he established order and structure, he sat down and started, he stooped down, excuse me, and started playing in the dirt and formed the vessel 
out of clay. And he was the potter before we were the potter's house. <laughs> and he was the potter before Jeremiah was ever born. And he was the potter before there was anybody there to tell him he was the potter. And we were the first pot. Or to contemporize it, we were the first hard drive, the first computer that he loaded and equipped and mandated and commanded, and he made it out of clay and programmed it by breathing into its nostrils, verse seven, the breath of life, zoe, the breath of lives. It's plural, it's actually the breath of, <clears throat> the breath of lives, that when God got over the earth and he breathed into it, <sighs> he breathed the breath of lives. Let me make that plain. He not only breathed Adam, but he breathed Cain and Abel at the same breath. He breathed Eve. He breathed everything that would come out of them. He breathed Methuselah. He breathed Noah. He breathed Lemuel. He breathed Samuel. He breathed Mephibosheth. He breathed David. He breathed Zechariah. He breathed Zephaniah. He breathed the breath of lives, all of eternal, the eternal breath into a human vessel. It was going to take generations to explain the breath just passed from generation. In the eyes of God, there were only two men ever made. The first man, Adam, and the last man, Adam. Everything else was a derivative. So all of us lived in Adam or died in Adam and were born again in the last man, Adam. Oh, do you hear what I'm saying? So this is what we're talking about here. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life and man became a living soul, a living soul. I want to break this down just a little bit. It, he formed the body. He breathed into it the spirit, pneuma, pneuma, like when you get pneumonia comes from the Greek word pneuma, where we get air, where we get spirit. He breathed spirit into body. He breathed spirit into body and man became a living soul. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Can you remember all of this? I don't see you writing anything. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In my body, I have world consciousness. The only reason I get cold is because I have a body. When I die, dead people don't get cold. Dead people don't get cold, they don't sweat, it doesn't get too hot, they don't wipe their head. Dead people have no world consciousness. The only thing that gives you world consciousness is the clay pot you were made out of. What gives you God consciousness is your spirit. For God is a spirit, and they that worship him, John 4, must worship him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. So we know God in our spirit, we know the world in our body, and we know ourselves in our soul. In my soul I have self-consciousness. In my spirit, I have God consciousness. In my body, I have world consciousness. The soulish realm is the mind, the emotions, the memories, the incidents, the accidents. That's where all the pain and the happiness and the hurt dwells. That's what David meant when he said, no man cared for my soul. No man cared for how I was emotionally, eternally. That's where the, that's where the trauma hides, is in your soul. It hangs out in your soulish realm. Eventually it will affect your body. It will bring disease into your flesh. If you don't excommunicate it out of your soul, it will begin to show up in, in your body. But I am not my body. 
I just live here. One day I'll move. The lease will be up. And I have another building. Eternal in the heavens, not made with hands. If this earthly house or tabernacle shall be dissolved, I have another building eternal in the heavens. You understand? So when you say people died, they didn't cease to exist, they moved. Found a leak in the building and my soul has got to move. Oh, you gotta be, you gotta be past 50 to know something about that. I found a leak in the building and my soul has got to move. Don't you know my soul has got to move? Don't you know my soul has got I found a leak in the building and my soul has got to move. I thank God I have another building not made by it. Now you know something about that? Oh, that's an old song we used to say. I found a leak in the building. Cancer is a leak in the building. Come on, somebody. The virus is a leak in the building. I found a leak, I couldn't fix it. My soul had to move. And thank God I have another building not made by hand. That's what I'm talking about. So the Lord formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became, and, and he became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the eyes and good for food and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil came out of the ground from which I was made. That's why I can eat it. Because everything was sustained by it. Everything was grown out of it. It was grown out of what I am made of. Y'all didn't hear that. Never mind. Never mind. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Okay. So, so you're understanding that God has created this interconnected system between the celestial and the terrestrial. And my body is sustained by that which is terrestrial. But my spirit is sustained by that which is celestial. And just like my body needs to be fed, my spirit needs to be fed. And that, that's what brings you here tonight. This is not a restaurant. You didn't come to feed your body. You came to feed your spirit. And when you feed your spirit, like your body gets renewed when you feed it, when you feed your spirit, your spirit gets renewed. That's why you're streaming online, so that you can feed your spirit, so that you can feed your spirit, so that you will have the internal stamina and fortitude to withstand the wiles of the devil. Because we are not in the garden anymore. The utopia that was a controlled environment that was self-sustaining. We have been cast out of the garden into the wilderness where our faith can be tested. For a garden has parameters and a garden has intention and a garden has limitations and a garden can cover a specific territory of land, but wilderness can be indefinite. So when man fell into sin, he was cast out of the garden into the wilderness of this world and we are living in the wilderness. And that's why Jesus met Satan in the wilderness. He prayed in the garden, but he met the devil in the wilderness. Because our fight is in the wilderness, not in the control utopia of that which was created for us to be sustained in, but in the wilderness where the beasts dwell. There's only one writer that talks about during the temptation of Jesus Christ that afterwards he was tired and the angels restored him and it says in the presence of beast. Wow. Only one writer, in the presence of beast, in the presence of beast. Everything that God is doing for you now is in the presence of beast. Get the picture now. Jesus has fasted for 40 days. He has passed the test that Adam fell. 
the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Jesus passed the test, said Adam fell, that Eve fell, that caused man to fall. That's why he was able to be a spotless lamb because he did not succumb to the temptation in the wilderness. And afterwards he was tired and the angels came and ministered to him in the presence of beasts. Angels ministering, beasts watching. <laughs> angels ministering, beasts watching. Angels ministering, beasts watching. Whenever the angels are ministering to you, never lose sight of the fact that beasts are watching. Beasts are watching. Beasts are watching. Google that for me in the King James Version, in the presence of beasts. I see them looking for it. I want them to have it. In the presence of beasts. In the presence of beasts. Every blessing I ever got was in the presence of beasts. <laughs> Every door God ever opened was in the presence of beasts. Every good thing that ever happened in my life was in the presence of beasts. Snarling, gnarling, jagged tooth beast who would have loved to devour me in the wilderness of this world. But because the angels of the Lord encamp about them that fear him, I was protected in the presence of beasts, in the presence of witches, in the presence of Wicca, in the presence of warlocks, in the presence of demonic influences, I am surrounded by angels in the presence of beasts. Some of you are working in the presence of beasts. Some of you work on jobs in the presence of beasts. Come on, talk to me, somebody. In the presence of beasts, they are there watching everything you do, and your spirit can sense it. That's why you're anxious about something and you don't know what it is, because you're in the presence of beasts. They're always leering at you, looking at you. Satan has desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith fail you not. They're always glaring at you, waiting for you to make a wrong move. Make yourself vulnerable, compromise yourself so that they hire, so that they say that goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, because he cannot devour everybody, but we are always in the presence of beast. <laughs> in the presence of beast, you got married. In the presence of beasts. You didn't invite them, but they were there. What is the text? Mark 1.13, write it down. In the presence of beasts. They were there at the wedding. They were, they were there at the baptism. They're always there. They're there. They're here now. In the presence of beasts. In the presence of beasts. Always in the presence of beasts. But none of their presence could stop God's provision because the angels ministered their provision in the presence of beasts. So don't be afraid of their stare or their glare because none of their glare stopped Jesus from receiving the ministry of angels in the presence of bees. Oh, let me hear you on. I'm going to skip past Exodus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to uh, uh, run past Romans and and, 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 and so, so in the creation, we, we have something that we understand. The first thing we see is the Spirit Savior. When he moved upon the face of the waters, and the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, Spirit and water, Spirit and water. I indeed baptize you with water, but there's coming one after me who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus said, if you believe on me, as the scriptures have said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. This he spake concerning the Holy Spirit. So the first time we see the Spirit, we see water. Because there is a correlation between Spirit and water. Are y'all with me tonight? Is this too much for Wednesday? Okay, so there is a correlation. We see spirit moved upon the face of the water, spirit and water. And we will see that all from Genesis to Revelation, we will see a correlation between spirit and water. Many, many times people were filled with the Holy Spirit before they went in the water. Some after they came out of the water, there is an association. When Jesus came up out of the water, the spirit came and sat down like a dove upon him because the spirit was used to water because the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, and the Spirit Savior appears over the water. 
glory to God. So, number one, I want to talk to you a minute about the Spirit saving you, what I just shared with you, and how, let me, let me back up and justify why I call him the Spirit Savior. You don't need a Savior if you don't have trouble. And in Genesis chapter 1, we meet God with the earth in trouble. And it's important for you to understand that we don't have a God who shies away from trouble. We have a God who will show up in trouble. Jehovah Shammah, the Lord is present in trouble. He's there in the middle of trouble. And so when we are introduced to him in the book of Genesis, it is because the earth is in trouble and the earth was without form and void and darkness covered across the face of the deep and the spirit moved upon the face of the water. It didn't run from the darkness. It didn't hide from the water. It moved upon the face of the water. So the Spirit Savior moved upon the water. And then the speaking Savior spoke through the darkness and said, let there be light. And there was light and it was good. And the darkness comprehended it not. I'm moving from Genesis to John and from John back to Genesis because there is a light that darkness cannot swallow. The darkness was prevailing until God said, let there be light. And then the speaking Savior said, let there be light. And the darkness had to roll back. When God opens his mouth, darkness has to run for it. It cannot coexist where light is. I taught you before, darkness is not a thing anyway. It can't be measured, it can't be weighed, it can't be quantified. Darkness is not a thing, it is the absence of a thing. The definition of darkness is the absence of light. So whenever God says, let there be light, there cannot be darkness because darkness is the absence of light. If that is true about the earth, that's true about you. So if God says, let there be light, darkness has to flee. Because the only thing wrong, if the gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost. The only thing wrong with them is that there is darkness, and darkness is the absence of light. For God, who commanded the light to shine in darkness, has caused the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ to shine in our hearts. That's salvation. Whether you read it in Corinthians or read it in Genesis, that's salvation. That's speaking Jesus and darkness running. The speaking Savior spoke light and there was light and it was good. The stooping Savior played with clay on the sixth day and made the first man. And on the seventh day, the Sabbath Savior rested. On the seventh day, the Sabbath Savior, he, the one who said, I am Lord of the Sabbath, the Sabbath Savior rested. But Adam fell while the Savior rested. And so the Sabbath Savior had to break his rest and become, number five, the searching Savior. And the voice of the Lord walked through the cool of the garden. And God said, Adam, where art thou? He didn't ask where Eve was because Adam was Eve's mama. Eve was born out of Adam. So when he had breathed the breath of life, he had breathed Eve into Adam. Male and female created Eve them and called his name Adam. And the searching saviors knew that if he found Adam, he found Eve. So he didn't say, Eve, where art thou? Adam. Where art thou? The searching Savior broke his rest to find his lost son. What a mighty God we serve. The searching Savior who had just been the Sabbath Savior broke his rest and took a walk. And the Bible said that the voice of the Lord walked through the cool of the garden. I didn't know a voice could walk. A walking voice. Hey, that's Jesus. The word was made flesh. He is the walking voice. <laughs> Who came to search and to seek that which was lost. 
the searching Savior. And in order to redeem his lost son, he became the slain Savior. For Adam could not save himself out of his predicament. So God himself found an animal and slayed an innocent animal. Now, let me show you this. So I want, I want to make sure that you get this. And you're watching on television. I want to be sure that you get this. You're streaming on YouTube or Facebook. I want to be sure that you get this. God had to become the slain savior or Satan would have still won. Because Adam falling was not Adam's problem. It was God's problem. Salvation was God's dilemma. Because the moment Adam sinned, Satan had put God in a trap. Let me show you the trap. God loved Adam. God hated sin. As long as they were separate, that was easy. But when what God loved had connected with what God hated, it put God into a dilemma. If he killed what he hated, he would kill what he loved. And if he loved what he loved, he would love what he hated. That's why later the Bible says his right hand and his holy arm have gotten him the victory. Salvation is God's victory because sin was his problem to fix. So when you see the slaying Savior walking through to kill an animal, it was God's dilemma to walk out. Salvation is of the Lord. That's why we praise God. We don't praise our church. We don't praise our bishop. We don't praise our pastor. We praise our God. Because because he's a slain savior. Ah, shandobo shata, ibo shayata, he asa. Hey, bless his high name. I feel like taking a walk. Hallelujah! The slain savior, the slain savior brought about redemption, the slain Savior, slain an innocent animal. If the animal could talk, he would have said to God, I haven't done anything. And God would have said, that's why I got to kill you, because I need your innocence, not your skin. I need your innocence. And he gave Adam his innocence, and he gave the animal Adam's sin so that he could divide the one from the other. So, he, so Satan could never call God a liar. Because God said, the day you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. But he didn't say which you it would. So when, when he killed the animal, he fulfilled his law without killing his son. To God be the glory. To God. Uh. Yeah, yeah, who, who did it, 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 the slain savior. He was smitten of God, the slain savior. You don't have to slay the lamb anymore. You don't have to place no blood on the door. Someone has taken the place of the lamb. He is the great I am. You don't have to slay. <laughs> He slayed him. He slayed him. He slayed him. He slayed an innocent animal. And then, then, then he sewed a garment that covered Adam so that Adam would appear as the animal. <laughs> So instead of Adam appearing uh, like a tree made out of leaves, the Bible said when God found Adam, Adam was hiding in the bushes covered by leaves. That was man's attempt to save himself. It represents works. And the thing that was wrong with it is while Adam was sowing it, 
the leaves were withering yeah. because he had separated it from its source. Yeah. And the same problem with the leaf was the same problem that Adam had. Adam was separated from his source and the leaf was separated from his source and the blind can't lead the blind. And so what Adam had made to cover himself was dying while he was sowing it. But when God killed the animal, he covered Adam with the coats of skin and sewed together a covering or New Testament would call it a propitiation for our sins, an atonement, a covering for our sin. And with the blood of the lamb or the animal running down his thighs, he was covered because death was satisfied. I told you the day you eat, you'll surely die, but I didn't say it would be your death and it wouldn't be your blood. And without the shedding of blood, <laughs> there is no remissions of sin. So I would say to you as I close tonight that if you have to have Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John to preach Jesus, you're not much of a preacher. Because I only need Genesis. If you will tear out the first two pages of Genesis, I could preach till I died. Because what the first two chapters are is really the nut of the whole tree of the gospel. Everything that will ever be shared is in the book of Genesis. So all of the rest of the story finds its roots in the book of beginning. And through it, we catch glimpses of Jesus. We beheld the wonder of his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All you need is a glimpse. Paul said, I count not myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching to those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Why is he chasing Jesus? Because Jesus knows who I am. He added up when I would be born, what I would have, what my IQ would be, what my EQ would be, what my adaptability quotient would be. He added up what the anointing would do with me. He added up what pain would do with me. And when he hit the sum total button, before I could read it, he ran and said, chase me. So I'm chasing him to find out who I am because he knows what I can do and he knows what I can be and he knows what I have and I want to catch a glimpse. How far can I go? How high can I jump? How long can I run? How much can I reach? What can I do? I count not myself to have apprehended, but I'm chasing him. Oh, that I may apprehend that which I'm apprehended of. I want to catch the one who caught me. I want to chase the one who chased me. I want to find the one who found me because he knows who I am. Tonight, if you're on crack, if you're on cocaine, if you're suicidal, if you've been hexed, if you're under a spell, if they've worked roots, if you've got a curse, if you've got a mental issue, tonight all you need is a glimpse of Jesus. I didn't even use Exodus, it would have taken too much time. But Moses caught a glimpse of him. <laughs> and his whole face was lit up with the glory of God. And the brightness of the glory of God from a glimpse of the back parts was so strong that they had to veil his face. 
Yeah, because one glimpse of God is enough to get into the pores of your skin and cause your face to be illuminated with the glory that comes from God. And God told Moses, he said, no man has seen me face to face and live, but I'm going to put you in a rock and I'm going to cause my goodness to pass by you. And after I walk past you, you can see my back parts. And if you catch a glimpse, a glimpse was enough to cause his face to light up. A glimpse is enough to deliver you from your addiction. A glimpse is enough to rebuke suicide. A glimpse is enough to get you off of crack cocaine. A glimpse is enough to make you stop beating your wife. A glimpse is enough to change your attitude and disposition. A glimpse is enough to give you joy and sorrow. Behold, all you need is a glimpse. If you catch a glimpse of his glory, it is enough to change your life. Oh, my brothers and sisters. 44 years ago, I caught a glimpse. And I've been running ever since off a glimpse. A glimpse of his glory. A glimpse of his goodness. A glimpse of his grace. If you're watching right now, you just need a glimpse. If while I was ministering and you got a glimpse of Jesus, I want you to type on the line, I see something. I see it. I see something. I see a way out of this wilderness. I see a way out of this depression. I see a way out of this fog. I see a way out of this pain. I see a way out of this sorrow. I see a way out of it. I see a way I couldn't see it before. If it be hid, it's hid from them that are lost. But something happened tonight and God said, let there be light. And I caught a flash. It was like lightning. It was quick, but I could see. I see something and I'm going to chase the light. I'm going to chase the light till my body is whole. I'm going to chase the light until my spirit is healed. I'm going to chase the light until my soul recovers. I'm going to chase the light until I'm not schizophrenic. I'm going to chase the light until I can rest at night. I'm going to chase the light until cancer shrinks out of my body. I'm going to chase the light, the light, the glorious light. Devil, I will not die in this wilderness. I will not collapse in this wilderness. I will not decay in this wilderness. I shall not die but live and declare the works of the Lord. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness. No more night. I see something changing me, healing me, blessing me, fixing me, restoring me. I'm going to drag my children under the light, my spouse under the light, my house up under the light. I want my finances under the light. That's what's wrong with my money, is that it's been dark money. It's been dark money. How are you going to prosper with dark money? You need God to send you money that's got light on it, that's got favor on it, that's got strength on it, that's got power on it. You need the provision of the Holy. Let that be light. Not just in your wallet, but in your heart, in your mind, in your soul, in your spirit. Let there be light. Light will drive out darkness. Light will drive out debt. Light will drive out depression. Light will drive out discouragement. If I close today, I want to challenge you to walk in the light to give in the light, to sow in the light, to love in the light, to plant in the light, not murmuring, not complaining. That's why God will only accept a cheerful giver because God will not take an offering from a dark place. Let there be light. If you need to sow in this moment, you should sow in this moment. You should plan in this moment. You should, you, should, you should sow in the light of the truth of who he is. You should plant in the light of who he is. You should honor him in the light of who he is. Don't let the presence of beast 
stop you. Because the angels want to minister to you. And he will. <laughs> and he can. And he shall. And there's some things that God has for you. But you got to have it in the light. And I challenge you right now. Whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you to sow, whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you to do, obey him. Because things don't grow in the dark. They only grow in the light. And if you do not know, if you do not know, if you do not know, if you do not know Jesus in the free pardon of your sins, I know it's Bible class and it's not a revival. But I would be so proud to pray for anybody in this room that you might come to know him. Because if you would come to know him, he would grow in you and heal you and bless you and strengthen you. We can do them both at the same time. Some people are giving offerings. Some people are giving their lives. We can do them both at the same time. I, I got filled with, the, I came back to the Lord and got refilled during an offering. Everybody else was giving money. I was walking down the aisle crying. Ah! God doesn't care what time in the service it is to do what he wants to do. He just does what he does because he's God. Away with all our form and fashion and you got to read the scripture first and then say the prayer and then do the, just shut up. God can do whatever he wants to do. Somebody, somebody caught a glimpse. Ah, and a glimpse delivered them and set them free. You can be made over oh, right now in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Those of you that the Spirit touched to give an offering, hold it up high, pass it down to the left, pass it down to the left, and they'll receive it. Those of you that are on the line, pay the, uh, uh, obey the directions that are on the screen. And, and do, and do, and do, and do what God says do. And those of you that are right on the brink of giving your life to Christ, you are the reason we sow. So that we can keep reaching out and reaching you and pray and pay all the camera crew and all the staff and all the things we have to do to make sure that when you click on us, we are there. We have been giving so that you would have the chance tonight to turn your life around and you need not kill yourself. You just need to find yourself. You've been hanging out with the trees, but you're not one of them. And you've been dressing in the leaves, but you're not one of them. And God wants to come and get you. And he's willing to break his rest to save his son, to save his daughter, to save you. If there's one in this room that does not know Jesus and the free pardon of your sins, or you're backslid and you drifted away and something has touched your heart tonight, don't be afraid of these people, they just people. Just hold your hand up high and say, pray for me, I need, I need to get my life together, I need to come back to Christ. Don't be afraid of anybody, hold it up high. If you need Christ in your life, if you need Christ in your life, everybody in here safe, everybody in here ready for heaven, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. If you're out there and you don't know him, do not let this broadcast in. Without Jesus, there's a number on the screen to pray with you, but I'm going to pray with you now. And then you can ask them your questions and tell them your problems and they will pray with you about that. But I will pray with you right now just as simple as saying, Lord Jesus, I need you in my life. I confess my sins. I'm tired of living in the wilderness with the beast of this world. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me and I shall be whiter than snow. I long to be whole and healed and delivered and free. 
I accept you as my Savior. Come on, say it. I accept you as my Savior. I take you as Lord in my life. And I confess from this day forward, I will walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Give him all the praise you got. Come on. Come on. Give him all the praise you got. Look what he did for you. Look what he did. Look what he did. Look what he did. My God, look what he did. Look what he did. Praise him, praise him, praise him. On the couch, in the living room, on the porch, let everything that have breath give him the glory. Catch a glimpse. Catch a glimpse. Just a glimpse. A glimpse. A glimpse of him. A glimpse of him. A glimpse of him. A glimpse of him. I want. I just need a glimpse of Jesus. 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 I don't need a blunt. I need a glimpse of Jesus. I don't need a needle. I need a glimpse of Jesus. I don't need another lover. I need a glimpse of Jesus. I need a glimpse of Jesus. I want to see Jesus. Let me see a glimpse of Jesus. Show me 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 Jesus. I need a glimpse of him. Don't let him close till I get a glimpse of him. Let me in, let me in, let me in. I want to see Jesus. I want to see him. 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 